tell you about one particular implementation of, of the, this graduation program, the one in Ghana. The one reason why the one in Ghana is of specific interest is that there was a conscious attempt in this one version to try to separate the elements that the many elements that go into the into the graduation program taken together. So this is clearly and by design an omnibus program. And one of the challenges with an omnibus program is to then know what what, what do you make of it, what's what's the what's the bottom line? What do you need and what's essentially nice to have or uh, you know makes makes us more reassured or maybe has no value whatsoever and what's actually core. And I think that's that the attempt in this particular study was to try to make some judgment about that. So when you look at the evaluation of you know the effect of a program like this, you, you part of that, I mean this is a program you already heard about it, there is a bunch of different ingredients, there's an asset transfer, there is training, coaching, hand holding, there is some some sort of so life skills advice and health advice. There's some consumption support, and then there is a, an insistence on savings, uh, which varied across countries a little bit, but still, all of these are potentially each individually capable of generating the effect. You could tell stories under which each of this is enormously valuable, and then you might imagine that there is something else that sort of the, that you know, putting them together makes an even bigger difference. So we'll try to say something about each of those questions. Is it, so how much of it is sort of each of these components and uh, how much of it is the rest? So I, I, you'll see that what I can say is more limited than what I would aspire to say. Three growth interventions will be mainly studied here, though we actually studied more than that and with a longer uh, clock I would tell you one more thing, but this, this, this is already a, okay, a lot, lot to cover. Um, there's the, the graduation program, uh, as you, which you heard about. There's a savings program which was just a savings program. And one of the uh, things that was uh, specific in the graduation program in Ghana at least was that within the graduation program we're going to see some version with and without savings. And then in addition to that, we'll see what happens if you just have the savings. Finally, we'll have what we call in the Ghanaian context, a go drop, an asset transfer, a pure asset transfer. Imagine a boat dropping from the sky on your head and then then you take it from there. There are people who very much believe that savings opportunities are the sort of key ingredient, and a lot of people who will say that, you know, you just transfer it, them an asset, forget about the rest. So I think those two were the main competing hypotheses, and we're, we're making a, a reasonably serious attempt to separate them. So the graduation program you know about, but I'll just summarize what it was in Ghana. It was a as an asset, I'll tell you what the assets were in a minute. There was a consumption stipend. There was savings collection. What's important about savings is that there are really two things here. One is the fact that somebody comes to your door or to some location and collects your savings. And that's often been argued as being the main constraint on savings is that, you know, it is impossible to force people to go to the bank and deliver savings there. So part of this was just that. In addition, there was a compulsory savings element that was tried as part of this program. So some people were required to save a certain amount. And that's, that's over and above having the opportunity to save. So there was both an opportunity to save and a requirement to save. The requirement to save was randomized, so only half the households had that. There was training, which was not randomized, and all the, all the hand-holding stuff was not randomized. Then there was a savings program. This was, again, the key ingredient in it was that everybody except the control group here were given the opportunity to, to give money to a savings collector. So the collection service was the key intervention. But in addition, some people had their savings matched. So 
one way of thinking about it is that you know you're spending a bunch of money doing the graduation program can you get the same result by just giving this as a very high interest 100 percent interest rate on the savings basically there was no attempt and it would have been foolhardy i think to try to control the amounts of money this is not saying that the same exact amount of money was spent in all of these programs it's more in that sense it's a much looser uh, exercise than we would have li liked. I think it would be very difficult to do, but the ideal experiment is one where you fix an amount of money and you use it in different ways. That's not this. what this is. This is a, since the match amount we can't control, uh, if people don't save anything, we don't pay anything in the match. So it's not that we are spending the same amount. So it's, it's in some sense we don't can't control that. That, that would be in some ways the ideal experiment is one that's not actually feasible unless you can put a you know gun to people and make this thing. And the asset drop was again uh, it was a uh, people were just given an asset, they were given a goat. But I think the theory under which this is supposed to work is precisely that you know you're giving people a certain amount of value and it's tradable. Goals both certainly are very uh, much uh, something you could sell, sell and buy in Ghana uh, and people do it all the time. So in that sense the idea was I'm giving them a certain amount of value. We don't have to worry about what currency that value is paid in. We give them a, it to, to them in goats and then we see what happens. If one of the options is they could sell the goat and you know buy a uh, treasure if that's what they want to buy. Uh, uh, to give it out if that's the, what their pleasure is. So in that sense it was the following the theory that basically all you're doing is transferring a certain amount of value, we gave them the most liquid uh, version of, uh, of, a, of an asset, which in the Ghanaian context is a goat. It's awkward to describe a goat as being liquid, but, um, but it's, it's sort of, if you see what the economics the usage of the word is, it's, it's very easy to trick. So this study design, this is actually not the full design, but it's most of it. So there was the full gap with savings, no savings, control, savings only, uh, <coughs> savings with match, control, asset only, and then the control buildings. So all of these things were, um, you know, so they, were all, they were all randomized. Uh, these are across communities. The randomization was across communities and then within communities. So 78 communities got GAP, 77 got savings, 76 got control, 45 got asset only. But within each village or community, people were randomized to do these different treatments. So the, what I'm going to talk about is the end line, which is two years after the asset transfer, and the follow-up, which is one more year later. So uh, that's the, when I say follow-up. Some you could call that the second end line. Mm. It's, it's basically two and three years after the asset transfer. So this is an example of the kind of table I'll show you for most of them. So I'm going to separate all the interventions and then pull all the control into one. That's not necessarily the only way we could have run, done the analysis. We could have thought of the control group as being, you know, the people who were separately never touched or the people who were a different control would be people who are within your village but don't get it. So these are all different potential uh, diff control groups. I'm going to pull all of them in these results. You, the results are not immensely sensitive to that, but there are different nuances. One of the things they're getting is um, they're getting seeds. So there's a bunch of the intervention is actually not goats. They, the, uh, you, you must might remember, uh, the intervention allows them the choice of the asset. So many of them, when, you're, when I show you results on agriculture, that's, that's big, it's worth keeping in mind that a lot of these people basically chose free seeds as the, as the intervention. And you see that those pe people who get free seeds indeed do, uh, do increase their agricultural <coughs> output, strikingly, so do the people who are just getting savings opportunities. And I think one of the stories that, just a story, uh, that 
I think we had told ourselves before this, and that not implausible reason why, is that once you give people the opportunity to, to say they, they have uh, an opportunity to acquire enough savings to buy an asset that they want. So for example, repair their house, buy a television, buy a, buy a, a big storage tank, one of the things that they seem to want. So some asset that costs a lot more money uh, becomes available. So the incentive, especially in the max case, is you know suddenly, you know, I can't really save at home, so I can never get to this big tank I want to buy. But now that I have this savings account, I can sort of put the money into it, and it's not going to immediately go away. And so I'll end up with my my tank or my my television. So that 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 sort of one potential explanation for this. And one thing that's consistent with that is that exactly in where we see the savings effect being positive and significant in positive, column one, savings seems to increase crop harvest by quite a bit. It's, uh, all, you know, it's on a base of 346, it's an increase of 60, so that's about a sixth. It's not a small increase. You see that in the column three, uh, they have also spent more on agriculture. So they, they seem to be exactly the people way who see an increase in output seem to have went and gone and bought something to uh, which ex sort of spent more resources on, on agriculture, which by, is consistent with the predict also getting higher returns. This is a pattern we'll see consistently, which is that what is striking, the graduation program has a durable So. This is just one year later. And now the effect is, if you notice the numbers, numbers are in fact larger with the graduation program. People seem to be accumulating assets. With the savings, it's gone. Savings was an, in, an opportunity to do something. They seem to have done it. Once they've done it, they, it's not that they expand their, their, so if they bought their television, they're done. And you see no effect. The savings effects are essentially not persistent. But you see that the inputs go down and the output goes down. This is not surprising. Uh, they, they have more assets at, as a result of, uh, of the ultra poor group. One thing that I also sh just want to emphasize, basically you find no real difference between the, when you add the savings to the graduation program, you don't see a big difference. That's something else that shows up in this table and will show up in general. That we do, you know, somewhere in that table is a line which shows the, you know, the p value for a difference between those, and there's just no chance to reject the view that these had the same effect. So there's no real difference between the savings component of the of the graduation program doesn't seem to have much of, much bite at least in this data. Sort of one place where you. Uh, you might have expected the savings to show up is in that, and you don't see it, so it might not be, for example, an asset that is mainly driving that. It might be a social occasion, some other, some other aspiration. You don't see it very much here. Uh, and what's also striking is that if you look at the the the, uh, the graduation program results, it's clear that the effect is very durable. These effects are essentially the same in column one. The effects are slightly smaller in the first end line than the second end line. So over time, people are actually accumulating assets rather than decumulating assets. They are more likely to have started <coughs> businesses. Um, business profits goes up. Remember, this is a program, it's an omnibus uh, program with multiple interventions effectively. Some people are starting a business, other people are just investing in agriculture. So when you look at this, it's not that the same person is getting, you know, starting a business and expanding the agriculture. These are different people who are diff doing different things. These are choices that people are making and what, what, what we are showing you is average for the population. A much smaller fraction of people uh, expand, um, you know, start a, start a business, and those people you see increases in business income. The business income increase is small, but then very few people do it. Fraction of people who add a business is only only eight percent more. So it's not the numbers are not enormous. That persists, 
again, savings does not have an effect on this. Food security, strikingly, there's really no systematic effects except from savings. And savings has a max savings seems to have a very strong effect. So the one place where the savings has a very clear and very robust effect is on max savings and something related to that, which is on dealing with shocks. So did you deal with shocks? We actually have a specific set of questions on that. And both of those seem to be affected by max saving. So what seems to happen is that these people seem to have some money kept somewhere as in a, a, in, you know, in, in the account for, an, for this kind of occasion, and you do see the effects on that. Now, one thing I should have emphasized, you see nothing on asset only, except occasionally a negative. The one place where you do see a difference is this one, and here, the, this is just the fact that they have an asset. So the asset index goes up because you gave them an asset. That's not exactly news. Otherwise, the asset only has no effects. It really, it's one of the more robust facts here. It has occasionally negative effects, but really no effects. There are many different ways of, of measuring consumption. There are many different versions of this. Some effects are significant, some are not. But let me just show you the summary. If you take total consumption, uh, you see some effect of the in follow-up. You see some effect of the of the uh, graduation program. Almost no effect of, of the others. If you look in the first end line, you do see an effect of the savings program, exactly as you would imagine. That was, you know, more or less when the program is ending. And so they still have some savings left, and that seems to have an effect that goes away over time. Financial inclusion, this is at the first end line. Uh, there's a clear positive, they have savings, they have formal savings, etc. Uh, that's one thing that does persist over time with the savings program. Again, the asset only has none of these effects. The savings program has a smaller effect than the uh, graduation program, but it persists over time. Here's a kind of interesting, if you look at the, this, you might be a bit startled. The graduation program has a negative effect on health spending. So you might wonder why. Uh, and it's quite systematic, it's significant in all the problems. You don't see that with the savings program, which if anything has a positive effect, that effect kind of goes away, basically. And I think that's really uh, potentially reflecting the fact that health expenditure is partly a result of mental health. People, when they're depressed, they often go to the doctor. So one possible reason why we see this is that mental health actually improves in the graduation program. One reason not to believe that explanation is that uh, you, the savings program has a positive effect on health spending and we see positive effect on mental health as well. But maybe the savings program, there are two things you need to go to the doctor. One is you need to feed the need and the second is you need to see the, you need to have the money. And the savings program matches those two things. So, uh, so it may well be that this should have different effects. You should have money. Uh, physical health, some effect, um, not so clear that this is also not a mental health effect. People are spending less time in paid labor and maybe more time spending to animals. That doesn't happen with the saving that you would, would have imagined. Whereas with the savings, you do see an effect of spending on business. None of the interventions had any impact on education, paid work, and any of the social involvement and women's empowerment measures, that's sort of disappointing, I would say, uh, given that these were, there were substantial effects on many things. We don't see any effects on this, any of these outcomes. So to summarize, um, it seems that 
the acid only intervention had no effects. So one thing that the clearest result is that you don't get very far by just handing out a boat. Second, the savings uh, intervention seems to have a short term positive effect which mostly goes away. You don't see it in the second second end uh, line for the most part except the effects on financial inclusion which might very well be habit formation of some kind. So you do see that one consistent pattern. The complementarities have some role to play because if you look at the, the save, savings effect and the, um, the just the graduation program, you add those two and you look at the savings, the graduation program with the savings map, the effects seem to be larger, but this is really a matter of looking, reading the tea leaves. This gets very delicate at this point. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. A, sl a small three minute follow up about some of the mental health and psychological issues uh, connected to these types of programs and the key issue of self esteem. One of the um, themes for, for today and for this session is trying to understand whether the different components are all important asset transfers, enterprise training, consumption stipends, savings health support, coaching and confidence building, community mobilization, there are a lot of things there. And whilst we've got positive results on the program overall, we're not quite clear about the contribution of different components. And Abhijit's presentation just now has thrown some very useful insight onto this. It's one of the first studies to do so, so it's telling very important results. I chose to look at, uh, in partnership with Mushtaq Chowdhury and with Jinnat Ara, who are here with us today. Uh, Mushtaq is the principal investigator of the study I'm describing. Jeanette has been doing most of the work on, on, on this study. And we were motivated by the by many visits to the field, visiting the, the TUP program. One of the things that I observed, and many people have observed, is that is the transformation in the outlook of the clients, of the participants in the program. When you first visit them, very shy, covering their head, not willing to talk to you, no real expectations about the future. And when you go back after a couple of years, there is a complete transformation. They're dressed better, they're smiling, they're confident, they come out and talk to you, they shake hands. A real huge change, which is very visible. And we've heard people this morning talk about um, the idea of giving people confidence and giving them hope giving them aspirations. What actually do we mean by that? And do we program for it? Well, in the BRAC program, in the Targeting the Ultra Poor program, they do target for that. Uh, we've talked, and Mushtaq talked about the, uh, the weekly visits that are made to the households. And these are not just the training for the enterprises, but these are coaching, life skills, and trying to encourage the female participants to have a, a positive view about their future. And our research was designed to try and look at the extent to which these inputs into confidence building contributed to the <coughs> program outputs. So if you spend time coaching individual women on a one-on-one -on -one basis every week over a couple of years, it doesn't make any difference in terms of the consequences for material outcomes for these households. Well, we've got the results from the uh, study done by Robin and his colleagues, which have demonstrated that the program does indeed have a positive contribution. What we're looking at is to try and understand whether that positive contribution was in part due to improvements in psychological well-being. And just to, just to step back very quickly on that, um, you might think there are so many different poverty programs around and they don't bother so much about psychological well-being, they'll just transfer cash or provide savings. One of the motivations for the, for the targeting of the poor program in Bangladesh was the recognition that there were households out there, as Mushtaq pointed out this morning, there were households out there that were not benefiting from the mainstream development program, the microfinance program. They were not taking part, and Mushtaq described some of the reasons why, why that may be the case. And the research demonstrated, when this program was first being designed, the research demonstrated the fact that there's some sort of structural break between the poor and the poorest. 
And if you look at correlations between poor and poorest households and their characteristics, you find that the poorest households are indeed often quite different in their characteristics, more likely to be widowed, less likely to have an, um, an adult male able-bodied in their household, less likely to have land, less likely to have savings, etc. And perhaps another feature of that is they're less likely to have the confidence to uh, take enterprises forward. So we, we explored this uh, with funds from ESRCM, from DFID, uh, from the Development Frontiers Challenge Fund. Uh, we've, we've completed a stage one proof of concept. First of all, we had to actually identify a model of psychological well-being and then try to um, fine-tune it to Bangladesh conditions and apply it to the households. So we, we, we took a, a North American model, in fact, from Carol Riff, uh, a eudaimonic model, which looks at uh, an all-round improvement or, or measures all-round performance in terms of mental health rather than concentrating just upon a happiness indicator. <coughs> and we took a subsample of the RED LSE sample, about 1,200 households, both participant and non-participant. And having gone through a, a fairly lengthy um, field testing process to develop a model that was robust to Bangladesh conditions, we then applied it. Um, it had six dimensions, autonomy, personal growth, self-acceptance, life purpose, mastery and positive relations. We found that uh, we could demonstrate that the BRAC program had contributed to improvements in psychological well-being compared to the control group. And in particular, through the exploratory factor analysis, we found that this was true, in particular in terms of autonomy, in terms of personal growth and self-acceptance. We found that autonomy was not actually positively associated with program participation. And perhaps part of the explanation, Jeanette's version of the explanation, is that because uh, women are encouraged to diversify their assets and, and to provide their husbands with assets, so perhaps they don't have that sense of autonomy. It also could be because of their close association with the program. So, to conclude, Richard, we've, what we found was that um, the BRAC program, through its coaching of individual women and its confidence building activities, has contributed directly to an improvement in their psychological well being compared to non program participants and that that contribution has resulted in improvements in material outcomes. So when we're thinking about which of these components are important or less important, but our researchers say, well, don't go necessarily to cut the thing which is most expensive, which is the staff time spent, because staff is a very high component of the total cost. Don't think about necessarily cutting the staff time. That could be a very, very significant contribution to the types of results that we're seeing achieved. Thank you very much, Martin. Great. Uh, gender balance is a good place to start. Uh, I'm the founder of the BOMA project. We work, uh, and what sets us apart is we're working in the arid lands of Africa. We're working strictly with women. Uh, the intent is to uh, focus on a resilience program in the face of shocks like drought. Um, what sets us apart also is we're doing uh, conditional cash transfers, we're not doing an asset transfer, and we're also leveraging technology uh, in order to work in these very remote regions of the arid lands of Africa. Um, the other uh, distinction is, is we have a group-based intervention, and that goes to this topic in terms of unbundling skills, in that uh, we have three women that run a business together. Um, and all uh, trainings and all mentoring or coaching is done in a group-based setting. Uh, we believe that that group approach um, has a number of, of benefits. One is that uh, it's a self-reinforcing learning uh, module. Uh, it also insulates many of these ultra-poor women from the demands of family and um, extended family for uh, financial assistance or credit. Uh, it's not an individual who owns the business, it's a group of women that own the business together. They also save together, um, and then micro-trainings are delivered over the course of the two-year program through monthly savings groups meetings. And again, there's a group and a self-reinforcing uh, uh, component of, of how that works. Uh, we feel strongly in the power of the mentor uh, or the coach, uh, to, to your point. 
um, in terms of making sure that the business survives. 97% of our businesses are still in operation at three years. Um, right now, we're graduating about 93% of the women in our program out of extreme poverty based on food security, sustainable livelihood, shock preparedness, and human capital investment. And I think I'll end it right there so we can keep it moving. I work for Mont Jose in um, Haiti where we have adapted and are using uh, essentially the BRAC program. Uh, we were taught the program by BRAC with a lot of staff, BRAC staff time involved. So our intervention is really theirs with a little, couple of little tweaks based on the unusual circumstances we find in Haiti. As far as the education goes, it's interesting that in Ghana they didn't find any impact because in Haiti uh, education has been the largest and most persistent impact we found both at graduation and as many as four years after graduation, we find the percentage of families who are sending all their children to school and whose children complete the school year, uh, not having to drop out because of lack of funds, is dramatically decreased by the graduation program. It's a huge area of impact for us. The second thing I would say is that in terms of assets, we regularly have both an increase in the value of assets beyond what we transfer um, and an increase in the number of different kinds of assets. So for example, this week we have a, a cohort graduating and our transfer of assets was about 150 US dollars, 155, and the value at, at point of graduation was a little over 400 US dollars. We transfer two types of assets and the average uh, family had uh, four different kinds of income generating activities at graduation. So that's the second thing. The third thing is really a question of, of health. Um, it's a very complicated area for us. We work in a part of the country where very fortunately everyone has access to free health care. Now almost none of the women we work with or their families use that access before they get into the program. They simply don't know how. They don't know how to show up at a hospital, get in the right line, get their registration card, and they don't even think in terms of the hospital. They think in terms of the easiest thing, which is hoping that the sickness will disappear. So uh, with extensive coaching and accompaniment, we're able by the end of the program to get a, a, a large majority of the people who need health care to choose to access health care. So that's about all I would say. One of the key issues we're talking about here is that um, what else do you need apart from assets to graduate poor people out of poverty? And I think one of the slides that Abhijit put up was very powerful in just reminding us that the BRAC approach and many of the others that are being replicated involve a degree of additional support, where, whether it's training, skills for, to use the assets, some sort of uh, other shock or resilient support like savings or access to health as BRAC gives, uh, and also some types of, if you like, coaching in basic competencies that enable women to build their confidence. Uh, so we're trying to look at some of that mix because those are the issues that make the assets effective. And dropping goats on people doesn't work, we know that. So, um, but we also getting a little bit of a sense that, uh, just as Albert said earlier and others around, that the difference of context means that the difference of mix may, may be, the different mixes may be appropriate in different contexts and we're still struggling with that. From what I understood, you were saying that savings did show up significant in terms of resilience and less than the masses. So if you're thinking about sustainability of these programs, then my interpretation of what you're saying was actually savings was a really key part in terms of that, that longer term resilience to shocks and the ability to, to sustain the changes. I mean, I, certainly you were talking about the, sort of the ongoing impacts of the asset accumulation, but I just want to understand a little bit more around that savings aspect and, and how, how key you would see that in terms of the results. I just wanted to ask, um, in terms of what you were asking about looking at what an asset is, I would like to suggest is indigenous knowledge considered an asset? 
Um, so indigenous knowledge in all parts of the world have been forgotten or disconnected from. And if you look at the Green Revolution was put into India in the 70s, um, and they've been blighted with issues of remorse to GM coffee, the BT and pesticides. But then you look at what is happening in Europe, you've now got 38 countries who have committed to going organic because the people themselves, not the governments, are actually wanting to reclaim their indigenous assets. So is that something that can be considered? Um, I just wanted to actually add on to the savings question because I think that's also very interesting how you see it has a positive effect and that dissipates sort of in the, in the short term. Is, has it got to do with the model of savings use? Could you envisage a program where you could prolong that effect over the period of the follow-up? Um, and have you looked at, at any other types of savings programs? Um, Abhijit, do you want to ask the, answer Anton's question and perhaps take Astrid's question next and then Steve will have a comment on it as well. Savings by itself seems to have contributed to resilience, but when you add the compulsory savings to the ultra-poor program, it doesn't. That, that, that difference seems smaller, much smaller. The, its contribution seems to be in the year when the savings was there. Once they stop collecting it, the savings naturally dissipate. So it's not, so in some sense, that's not necessarily particularly, I mean, maybe, maybe we should keep collecting the savings, but we're not very good at telling them apart because after the end of the first few months where the consumption support was given, savings was no longer compulsory. So. Maybe people decided that they would rather invest in their assets, take the risk. They seem to have gone in the direction of not accumulating a lot of savings, I would say. I didn't go into the numbers, but mostly where they didn't have the choice, where the only option was investing, putting the money in the saving account or not, they put money into it. When they were another option, they put it into their, their new livelihood which is a more rewarding, if riskier, strategy. See, they they seem to have chosen to go with the, when we have an opportunity, I'm now, I have goats, I'll buy another goat. The assets keep going up over time. It's the savings is not the one that's going up. So at least from their point of view, the, the additional risk uh, smoothing benefits of savings do, doesn't seem to be big enough to compensate for the fact that it has much lower returns than just putting so the, when the, once the match ends, they don't seem to be that interested in the savings. So the savings just has low returns, and that's that's a, that's a fact. still a, still a, remains a problem. I think Martin's got a comment. I on think this just, just, just to add to that, I mean, Abhijit made, made the point about uh, liquid goats. Um, the asset also, um, if you like, it, is a savings substitute to the extent that it is highly liquid. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's more complicated to to understand. Um, household strategy dealing with shocks and potential food insecurities just by focusing on monetary savings. We need to take a more complete view, including understanding the relative liquidity of their assets. We are experimenting with different ways of savings because we found over the years that um, the, our initial approach was just to open passive savings accounts for our participants at the nearest uh, branch of our um, our sister MFI wasn't really helping. That um, at, at, as soon as the program was over, the women would find a way to get to the bank and drain out their savings accounts, and that would be that. So we're experimenting with village savings and loan associations. The initial evidence is very strong. We're also experimenting with a lockbox system where we we actually give participants a little lockbox. Their case manager keeps the key to the lockbox while they're in the program, but they have physical possession of the lockbox. And so far, we the results seem positive in both directions, but it's very early and we don't have much data. 
Um, we're using a lockbox system currently, um, and that's combined with micro trainings. And we know that when we combine the two, we get extraordinary attendance at those savings programs. What we want to understand is once those micro trainings end and it's just coming together to put money in, does the attendance fall off? And we want to take a look at that. But certainly the lockbox system works in a fantastic way for us right now. It's three different women hold three different keys. A fourth person holds the box. What we are looking at is moving that to an entirely digital platform. And we're doing a, a pilot with Kenya Commercial Bank on that. Uh, and it'll replicate the lockbox system in that three different women will have three different passwords to be able to open the account. But women in a very remote location in northern Kenya coming out of a hut with skins on it is, is going to be able to open up a bank account with um, just their ID card. And that's going to make that connection, we think, for them in terms of making that commitment to committed savings. I think the one um, evaluation I've, well, a couple of evaluations I've seen of, of um, lockboxes, people the, don't seem to use them very much. It's just the, uh, you know, there's a, I think, a couple of our cities, both of them find re, re, people who use them actually benefit, but most people don't want them. They don't want to put money into it. They, they, they'll take it, but they don't want to put money Is into that it. in the lack, if they have a choice between a lockbox and, say, a bank? Uh, they, I think, no. They have a choice between a lockbox and nothing, and they still don't take the lockbox. Hmm. Sada, I actually, I'm, I, I think I need to park your question, because I think indigenous knowledge is potentially an asset, but the assets that we're interested in are the ones that materially change the lives of extremely poor people. And the examples you gave about indigenous knowledge and GMT crops, and GM crops, and cotton in India, and so forth, I, I, I'm not convinced that that would take us down the channel of of uh, this graduation approach. But uh, we can take that up in the in the break. Okay. So my question is that a lot of times what we've seen is that it's not only development that people need; it's catharsis, it's therapy. You know, people are traumatized. Um, you know, there's conflict. And the biggest bang for the buck that we've seen in our program is this whole building the social capital, you know, the social mobilization. So my question is that there is very little in terms of, uh, you know, convincing donors and people who invest in these processes to invest in those soft things like conflict resolution, like social mobilization, like therapy, whatever you want to call it. So I think we really need help from the researchers here to put some value on this, to convince policy makers that it, and donors themselves, how can we put a value to it so there is actually money going for it. Great, thank you. Thank you. I have a question about the training uh, stage, because you said, as you, as you said, just don't think about something that doesn't really help. So I'm wanting to know what element of the training would be more important. Do you have any sense of what component of the training program has the biggest impact on these women? Great, thank you. Great question. And just in fact, yes? Um, my question is about more immediate policy implications and, and scalability of this, given the fact that it does depend and different results are coming out of different areas of the world and longer term studies are needed to understand longer term impacts. What can we do more immediately on the ground to scale these programs and have an impact? Great, thank you. Is there a consideration that by targeting whatever the benefits are into a specific locality, that some of the gains over time that we can all hope for would get reabsorbed by, by the landlords in that area? I mean, is there any measure of the degree to which rents might in the end go up, particularly if there's landless ultra poor who, who are then effectively transferring that back into, into the richer parts of that? Interesting, really interesting questions. Well. I'll take the first one. I mean, I, I know a little bit about that. There's, there is actually at least one randomized control trial of a social capital building program in Sierra Leone, and it has, finds nothing. Absolutely uh, very disappointing results, I would say. I mean, maybe I'm being a little bit cruel in saying that, but mostly it finds very little. I don't really, I'm not an expert, so I can't tell you why that one didn't do anything, but it didn't. Um, on the question of, you know, I think this, your question about the prices going up, most of the programs prefer to introduce 
assets which are mostly, you know, there's not really a resource demand on them, rather than uh, give people capital to buy a uh, scarce input like land, for example. It's very different where, what the supply of that of the, uh, the input you're buying with it. If it's a very elastic supply, then you don't have that effect. On the question of um, what can we do, I think the follow-ups now we have, you know, a bunch of fairly long-term follow-ups. I mean, there's never going to be an answer to the question, what will happen at kingdom come? So, I mean, we'll have to take a call at some point. I think six years uh, are, is quite a long time. And they seem to be, the effects seem to be, if anything, accumulating. Uh, we'll wait for Esther stock and Oriana stock later, but I think the effects seem to be accumulating. I would say the one key source of variation, if you had to plot the results of the different countries, is that in richer countries, it's harder to have a big effect. Per capita GDP is a reasonable predictor of of the size of the effect, or very good predictor actually. So, so basically, I think that might either be selection that the poorest people in richer countries are different people, or it's what the kind of training you can buy with a little bit of money in those countries is just not the same quality. You get much better quality training with BRAC for the same money than you get in Peru, where the same money just doesn't buy very much. I think my inclination is with the latter theory, but. We don't know that, but I think we do see a pattern, which is that it's going to be harder to do this in a country like Peru, uh, much richer country, middle-income country. You know. Shall we bring in Martin on this? Thing? A broader point, actually, which um, um, Abhijit triggered to some extent. And we've had questions about the importance of social, social mobilization, elements of training. One thing that's quite important to recognize is the motivations behind adopting graduation programs. And in the case of Bragg, they were very disappointed that their program was not getting through to extreme poor households. They had experience with other programming, um, to emergency response and through the IGBGD, to work with extreme poor. So they had some ideas, but they were highly motivated. And as a consequence, I think, their, their attention to the quality of implementation was very high. What we've observed um, across BRAC, and what we've seen is, is true of other programs in Bangladesh, is that you actually need to recruit new staff. You need different staff. You need staff with a different motivation. I think as a consequence of BRAC paying attention to the quality of implementation, they've been able to get these very good results. I think the same is true of Foncosi. But if we say, look, this is a great model, go for it, and people don't have that motivation and just think, okay, Maybe this is a way to save money on our social protection budget in the long run, so let's start using it here, there, and everywhere. I think we're in grave danger of not paying sufficient attention to aspects of implementation which are critical to the, to the success of the program. And I think that applies to issues about social mobilization, to the quality of training as well. Finally, just quickly to answer the point about capture, I think one of the key points that um, has been challenging for, for BRAC has been to try and understand whether they should be looking for new market opportunities or whether which some donors would like them to or whether they should concentrate upon more traditional activities where indigenous knowledge for example becomes important and on the whole they have found that the concentration on traditional activities which won't have a large impact on, on the local market have been the way to go and this avoids the problems of capture if they organize their program around land or around um, assets or agriculture, it might be quite a different thing. But by focusing primarily on livestock, they've been able to avoid issues of capture, by and large. Great. I, th I think we've, we've dealt with a little bit of Amanda's and uh, a little bit of Asma's. Um, uh, just Amanda, uh, in terms of your question, uh, I mean, we work with women that are, are all illiterate. Uh, so the training programs obviously have to be tailored to that. But illiterate in that they can't read and write. But um, certainly in terms of their financial literacy, being able to do subtraction and addition and multiplication, that those, that's there. Um, most of our training programs are done through fables, using illustrations. Very little bit of it is a lecture. Those trainings are then reinforced by the mentoring visits that follow. Um, we can only do it once every month because we are working in a very remote area. Um, I think it's also this the idea from these women that school is for children 
uh, and 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 that that's not what they do. And once they start to um, engage in some of these training programs, they suddenly realize that they are capable. And I think that goes a lot to what we put at the heart of our program, which is dignity and choice. Um, and when they start to see that possibility, then they start to search out adult literacy programs. And I think that when we think about women living in extreme poverty, um, they are going to hit a ceiling if they don't have some level of literacy. Um, now, we have none of those resources available to us where we work, except in very isolated cases. But when it's available, women seek it out. In fact, they recognize the importance of indigenous knowledge, and they um, prioritize those activities which can capitalize upon indigenous knowledge. And that is why there is this primary focus upon livestock production, rather than looking at new market opportunities. And I think that's also consistent with, um, with a concern with sustainability as well, because they are using things which are essentially renewable in operation. But usually livestock is different from Yes, they're not promoting um, large-scale crop farming, they're not using GM crops, they're not using fertilizers, they're not using any form of um, um, inorganic fertilizer. I mean, it's really important that people look beyond their immediate focus of research or their immediate program experience. And part of your answer about how much agencies are prepared to uh, uh, invest in the soft if you like, the, the people skills that you need on the ground, the delivery capability, the types of the right types of people, uh, which is a balance between local and external expertise, is obviously framed partly by what's in decision makers' policy minds and what it looks like on the ground where you can justify the cost. And I think that in, the, in relation to this community outreach that you definitely need if you're going to reach the right type of people and extreme extremely poor women particularly, that the women's empowerment agenda is, in the, is really at the top of people's policy um, minds. There's a, a high level panel which the UK Secretary of State is about to agree with the Secretary General on women's economic empowerment. And that is an opportunity for people to uh, you know, insert this type of graduation approach into that global debate. My only other comment as a practitioner is, uh, you know, it is great to be here. It's great to be with leading thinkers. I started as an as a academic anthropologist. I did an anthropology PhD, spent two years in an Indian village studying the community, and I came out very much of the view the point is to change the world, not just to study it, hopefully for the better. And we can't wait seven years for the next set of studies, in a sense. We have to operate on good enough evidence. And so I would, I would uh, look for some creativity in the way that people look at the, at the variety of evidence that is out there for these graduation approaches and inevitably when we actually start in individual countries we will be adapting to context and I think that is a key principle that BRAC has learned which is go out, pilot it, find out what works, get feedback from beneficiaries, adapt because there's lots, been lots of failure in BRAC as well as lots of success and see what works for that context. On that note, thank you very much everybody.